Okay, thank you for joining us for today's uh, webinar. Uh, we're fortunate to have Professor Kevin Riley uh, with us today from the Division of Biostatistics. He received his PhD in, in statistics from Columbia University in 2000. Um, and he um, is also the Associate Director of the Coordinating Centers for Biometric Research. His work focuses on design implementation and analysis of clinical trials on infectious diseases with an emphasis on HIV AIDS and Ebola virus diseases, and now of course COVID. Um, he's got interest in many other topics in chronic diseases as well, such as COPD. So he's been highly involved with multiple clinical trials as well as a cohort study of Ebola survivors. And as we'll hear today, he's right in the thick of these COVID therapeutic platform trials using highly innovative methods. Uh, and I think this is really critical. A lot of the focus has been on vaccines and rightly so, but um, we're gonna need efficacious therapies for, for quite a while with, shall we say, COVID survivors. Um, and his work has been really well-funded by the NIH um, and other sources. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Kevin. So thanks, Mark. Okay, so um, thanks everyone for uh, attending the webinar today. So um, the title of my talk is here. And uh, I, I guess I'd first like to start off that, uh, although I'm the presenter, there are many, many people who have worked very hard to make all this work possible. You know, I, I, it's gotta be thousands of people involved in making all this work possible. And that's not even including all the part study participants. Um, so, so this is uh, about platform trials for COVID-19. And, you know, I guess uh, COVID-19 at this point is a disease which needs no introduction, uh, but just to, you know, keep everybody up to date, I think the current estimates are around something like uh, over 114 million people have been infected with about a little bit over two and a half million deaths worldwide. Um, so, you know, it, as the COVID epidemic started, uh, there was great interest in, amongst many investigators in trying to uh, investigate therapeutics and, tr you know, effective treatments for people who have uh, been infected with the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And, um, you know, that, that's great. There's, you know, a huge demand for effective treatments here. Um, but this has led to, you know, the, the development of thousands of clinical trials for treatments of COVID. So here's a kind of an old slide when there were only, uh, you know, a little over 2,000 such studies listed on clinicaltrials.gov. This morning, that number was about 3,200. Um, with 1,500 currently enrolling. So um, while that's great, the downside of having many trials for the same uh, illness is that the trials are competing with each other for participants. Um, with lots of trials hastily put together, there's a concern that they might not be well designed, and in particular, they might be a little underpowered. Um, so the government, to its credit, realized that this was uh, this is a, a, an issue, and um, in, in April, the uh, NIH announced the program called Accelerating COVID-19 Therapeutic Intervac Interventions and Vaccines. So this initiative, ACTIVE as it's called, is a public and private partnership with co-chairs Francis Collins, who I imagine you know is the director of the NIH, and uh, Paul Stoffels, who's the chief scientific officer at Johnson & Johnson. And um, the executive committee includes you know, individuals from BARDA, NIH, FDA, and a number of uh, pharmaceutical companies. Um, OWS, you might not be familiar with that, stands for Operation Warp Speed, which is a mechanism that was used to fund a lot of this work. Um, and so within the active program, there were different areas of focus. One of them was vaccines, which you probably heard a lot about. There was also uh, a great interest in trying to develop effective therapeutics, and that was a, another component of the, the active program. So um, there have, you know, maybe been within Active. There have been different initiatives given numbers. So there's Active One, Active Two, Active Three. I'm actually not sure how high up the count goes. I think I heard talk of Active Five at one point. I, I, I'm actually not sure. Um, but Active Three is what we're going to talk about here. So this is part of this initiative, and the um, charge to Active Three is to develop, investigate therapeutics for hospitalized COVID-19 patients. 
So there's, you know, for example, a parallel effort called Active 2, which is looking at therapeutics in outpatients. Okay. So active three is what we, 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 we're talking about here. And on the initial focus of active three and, and active two actually, but you know, we'll, we'll focus on active three is um, the evaluation of a class of compounds called neutralizing monoclonal antibodies. Okay. Um, this was you know, initially thought to be uh, perhaps the best route to a highly efficacious treatment. Um, but you know, we active three is not totally committed to these NMABs as we might call them. There are potentially other treatments we might investigate too. Okay. But we're focusing initially and everything I'm gonna talk about in this talk will be about these neutralizing monoclonal antibodies. So what is a monoclonal antibody? So a monoclonal antibody is a protein produced by cloning an immune cell. Okay. So we typically, or people who develop these treatments get these cells by isolating them from COVID-19 survivors or some of them are from SARS from way back when, survivors, and uh, have then further engineered these cells to improve their immunological function. So for example, a common tactic in terms of this engineering would include modifications of the FC domain of the antibody to improve the longevity of the, of the protein. Okay. So many labs and pharmaceutical companies have established pipelines for rapidly producing a variety of neutralizing monoclonal antibodies. Um, and, you know, all the ones we're going to talk about here, and, and most of them, generally speaking, are administered via uh, an IV infusion. So the way that these work, it's thought, is that the molecule binds to the spike protein on the surface of the SARS-CoV-2 virion uh, envelope, and uh, thereby interferes with the binding of that spike uh, receptor to the ACE2 receptor on human cells. And so it's this binding of the spike protein to the ACE2 receptor that induces modifications to the cell and the virus, which allows binding of the, of the, uh, like the, the, binding of the two, the, the cell to the virus and thereby the, the virus can put its, uh, you know, genetic material inside the cell, make more virus, kill the cell and produce uh, ongoing infection. But there's other types of monoclonal antibodies that target other portions of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And um, there's also thinking that there might be effector function for some of these molecules. Um, this is, you know, they, they might themselves be capable of, of killing infected cells. So you know, we talk, this is a, a topic of, of great interest. You know, I think in the cancer, people investigate this a lot. And we talk about antibody, antibody dependent cellular cytotoxicity and antibody dependent cellular phagocytosis. So different mechanisms are potentially possible. The, the potentially possible, the, the clearest though, is this binding, the, the blocking of binding of the virus to the cell it infects. So um, there are, you know, I, I, as we see here, there are 11 uh, monoclonal antibodies that have been licensed for treatment of other infectious diseases, such as Ebola and rabies. Okay. <clears throat> so the, the active group, when they thought about how they might start up uh, investigations into therapeutics, they didn't want to start from scratch. So the thinking was, let's go out and recruit clinical trial networks to get this all going so that, you know, there's already some infrastructure established, some methods, some people who work together and could, could probably get this going quickly. So um, the, the active leadership group selected uh, the International Network for Strategic Initiatives and Global HIV Trials, INSIGHT, um, to lead this effort. So INSIGHT is a clinical trials network. Um, the PI is Jim Neaton, who's a professor here in biostatistics. And Insight is, you know, over the last 20 years or so has, has conducted some of the, you know, some seminal trials in HIV. Um, and so, you know, Insight is a, is a, is a, is a, a you know, virus network. So, so that seems appropriate, but Insight doesn't necessarily have all the expertise in pulmonary medicine that might be useful for trying to study something like COVID-19. So a couple other networks were also involved. We got also got involved. Um, one of them is this prevention early treatment of acute lung injury, PEDAL, uh, the Cardiothoracic Surgical Trials Network, CTSN. Um, there, we also reached out to colleagues at the VA. So components of the VA have traditionally worked with Insight, but um, typically within the context of Insight. So sort of there's been, there's a VA coordinating center that works with Insight, but we reached out more generally to VA coordinating centers that are independent of Insight. Okay, so we've got multiple uh, 
established clinical trials networks working together, and uh, these networks have access to over 400 sites globally. And so um, PEDAL and CTSN, and obviously VA, are, are mostly in the US. Uh, PEDAL and CTSN have some Canadian contacts. It's really insight that brings the, the global aspects to these trials. Okay, so um, the, the goal, okay, so the active thought will recruit these networks and we'll have them put together some kind of study. And uh, the uh, active leadership encouraged us to pursue a master protocol. So a master protocol is a trial protocol that's designed to answer multiple questions. And so it's, you know, master protocol is a pretty general thing. Um, so they, 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 these master protocols can address multiple treatments, multiple diseases or disease subtypes, and uh, or multiple treatments and diseases. So most of the work in master protocols here to, you know, prior to 2020 was um, in cancer research. Okay. So a platform trial or platform protocol is a type of master protocol that studies multiple treatments in perpetuity. Okay. So the idea is we're going to set up this clinical trials infrastructure and we're just going to introduce treatments as they become available. And as you know, and, and, and we'll try to understand the efficacy of these different treatments and the safety. Okay. So the idea is we'll set this up so the treatments can enter when they're available, they can leave if they're found to not be you know, safe or efficacious. Um, one aspect of this is if it's a placebo controlled trial, which these are, um, you can share placebos across groups to a certain extent or across treatments. So if there are two treatments under investigation at the same time, you can randomize people to either treatment or to a placebo. And so you, that common placebo group can be used across the different treatments and that's a, a potential source of efficiency in the trial. Uh, moreover, if you, you, you can design the treatment allocation ratios so that the more, and the, what we did is that the more treatments that are in the study, the better chance you have of getting an active treatment. And so, you know, we, we don't know these treatments work and we don't know they're safe, but that's an attractive feature to uh, recruiting participants into the study. You know, you can tell somebody there's a 75% chance you're getting an active agent that encourages people to participate. And so that, that's what we did. We, um, you're, we, we equally, we randomize, our randomization ratio is such that you're equally likely to get each treatment in the placebo. So the more treatments, the lower chances of getting the placebo. Okay, so as I mentioned, the Actus Free Leadership Group strongly advocated for this. Um, in none of the trial networks involved had experience conducting one of these sorts of trials before. Um, we did recruit someone who's, uh, a statistician who's worked for many years on a, a cancer platform trial, uh, Max Parma, who's a statistician at University College London, who's, you know, gave us a lot of insights in how we might do this better, um, was really a key, me a, a key member of the team early on, we were uh, designing this trial. Um, and other groups in 2020 were also looking to implement platform trials for COVID-19. So, um, and here, here are three of some of the larger of these endeavors, so the ACT group, um, which is now Active One, um, Solidarity, the Solidarity Trial, and the Recovery Trial. And so, um, unlike Active Three, these three platform trials, ACT, Solidarity, and Recovery, were focusing on repurposed med medications. So, the distinguishing feature of the Active Three platform trial is that we were investigating therapeutics specifically designed for COVID-19. So we call this trial TICO, which is short for therapeutics for inpatients with COVID-19. And our central question is, can these agents improve outcomes for individuals who are hospitalized for COVID-19 who are already receiving the standard of care, okay? So we're, these new drugs have to compete against whatever the standard of care is at the time that drug is introduced to the trial, okay? So as of right now, the study is providing, no, that's not, it's not helpful. Um, so right now the study is providing remdesivir, uh, which is currently recommended by the NHL treatment guidelines for people who are hospitalized with COVID-19. Okay. So everyone receives remdesivir um, unless it's contraindicated. And a small percentage of people don't receive uh, remdesivir in these trials, you know, less than 5%. Um, <clears throat> Okay, so the TICO protocol itself, it's a platform trial, but it included several innovative components. And so I'm gonna talk about a couple of these here. One of them is a novel endpoint for the primary outcome designed to be patient-centered while avoiding some common misclassifications. 
And the other innovative cast, uh, aspect of this trial I'm going to talk about today is uh, an early futility assessment based on a surrogate endpoint. Okay. So um, there are not yet standardized endpoints for COVID-19 trials in hospitalized patients. Okay. So in, in, in outpatients, it's not really standardized either, but usually hospitalization or death is a pretty reasonable endpoint for outpatient studies. Um, so you might think mortality would be a, a reasonable endpoint for a COVID-19 uh, hospital study amongst hospitalized individuals. Well, you know, the, even amongst hospitalized patients, the mortality rate is about 5% in, in what we're seeing in our studies. Um, so that's a pretty low event rate. And so that's gonna drive up the sample size to be quite large, okay? So you're gonna, in order to have a reasonably powered mortality endpoint, you're gonna need thousands of participants in your study, okay? So um, over the last several years, uh, ordinal endpoints have been uh, frequently investigated as an alternative mortality endpoints because they can provide more power, okay? And just to think through that a little bit, on the far left, we have a, a binary endpoint mortality. Um, so as I, as I mentioned with, you know, low event rates, uh, it could be difficult to power those studies. You need a lot of very large sample sizes. So the idea is it, well, I know with continuous endpoints, you generally have more power because the standard deviation is not so tied to the mean. And so if I can start, rather than just having a binary classification, if I could start introducing sort of more levels, so rather than just alive or dead in the middle, we have three levels, healthy, sick, or dead, or you know, on the far right, we've got six levels. So with more levels, you can increase the power of your study with the same number of participants. Um, a caveat of this is you actually have to have people in those different levels. So in my middle example, if everyone's healthy or dead and no one's sick, you might as well have a mortality endpoint. So if you're going to in, use an ordinal endpoint, some thought has to go into what the categories are um, so that you, have, you really want a good spread across your categories, equal representation at the different ordinal levels. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, so the um, selection of the time point for assessing ordinal, out ordinal outcome is pretty critical if you wanna realize the benefit of these types of outcomes. So for example, with COVID-19, if you wait two months and you have a three level ordinal outcome, you know, that's, um, that is healthy, sick or, or dead. Well, if you wait two months, basically almost everyone will be recovered or dead. So your power is the same for mortality endpoint. So the goal, if you're going to use an ordinal endpoint, is trying to select a time point that gets a good balance across the different levels. Okay, so you kind of want to, you want to select it not too far out so that you still have people in intermediate stages, but you want to select it far out from the time of the treatment uh, assignment so that you're not just reflecting, you know, the baseline state. Okay. <clears throat> Um, in addition to ordinal outcomes, time to event endpoints have been widely used. Okay, so the um, ACT trial that established the efficacy of remdesivir used um, time to hospital discharge. Okay, um, so there's some problems with those kinds of, uh, of outcomes. You know, hospital discharge is, is kind of a subjective decision and to a certain extent it varies where you are. So there's complications with those kinds of endpoints. Um, another problem with hospital discharge is it's not uncommon for people to be rehospitalized after being discharged. And an even more complex aspect of hospital discharge is that in many places, people are discharged to hospice care settings. So you wouldn't want to call that a recovery, right? Um, so for the TICO primary endpoint, we are using time to sustained recovery. Okay, and so it's an, it's an event dri driven trial. And so we've powered the study to uh, for the primary outcome to have but eight, with 843 events, we have a 90% power for a sustained recovery rate ratio of 1.25, sort of like a, a hazard ratio in the presence of competing risks. But I'll, I'll say a little bit more about that later. <clears throat> so the time to sustained recovery, it's the time when the participant is at home, okay, which is defined to be the last location where the participant was not in acute care setting. So if someone was in a nursing home and they get discharged back to their nursing home, they're home. Um, the participant has to stay at that location without being readmitted to a, another location for a higher level of care for 14 days. Okay. Um, so, so once you get your 14 days at home, you've met the endpoint. So if you get hospitalized on the 15th day, you've still, you've met the endpoint. Um, so the earliest date the possible for the sustained recovery is 14 days after randomization. 
if then that would occur if you're discharged right after your infusion. <clears throat> okay, so um, so that's the primary endpoint. But the the goal was to you know the thinking was that there's a lot of these monoclonal antibodies, and what we want to do is we want to have some way to get rid of them, to get rid of the ones that don't that that aren't going to work, that show little promise. Okay, um, <clears throat> so. You know, enrolling a thousand people and waiting for the all the you know enough people to have sustained recovery it will take a while, and so we could be enrolling lots of participants to meet that primary endpoint and discover that the agent's not efficacious. Okay, so um, we decided on an intermediate endpoint that would be used to make a no a go no go decision on agents based on an endpoint that'd be available on day five. Okay. So. Um, you know, I guess this reflects a little bit the nature of bringing together three clinical trials networks and trying to develop a protocol as rapidly as possible um, for our early futility assessment to make a go or no go decision on an agent. We ultimately settled on two ordinal endpoints assessed at day five. So one of them is a pulmonary endpoint based largely on oxygen requirements and I'll, I'll get into the details of that in another slide shortly. Um, and then we also supplement that, or, or I guess in parallel with that, there's what we call the pulmonary plus endpoint. It's like the pulmonary endpoint, but includes extra pulmonary events that are COVID-19 outcomes or complications. So here's the pulmonary outcome level. I don't, I don't want to get bogged down in this, but you know, the, the, the first, the, the, the lowest level, level one is can independently undertake usual activities with minimal or no symptoms. So that is probably what you'd call recovery. Okay, um, so, so that's the best situation. If we skip down to our seventh level, that's death. And then we have stages in between, depending on how much the patient needs assistance with breathing, basically. Um, so level two is you're symptomatic, but you don't need supplemental oxygen. Levels three, four, and five are various levels of supplemental oxygen. Um, and level six is uh, what you might call life support. Um, okay, and um, and you know this actually it's it's kind of tricky defining these different levels. It took a lot of training slot, a lot of training with this with the sites to get you know the distinction between four and five um, to, to get that well recognized. The pulmonary endpoint is basically the the pulmonary plus endpoint is your pulmonary endpoint with some cardio basically cardiovascular events added in at the various stages so one two and three are the same so those are the the lowest uh, severity levels of, of covid and then for um, the level four which required more than four liters per minute of oxygen we also add a number of you know cardiovascular events as you can see here um, for level five that was you know a greater need for supplemental oxygen we add in acute stroke for level six, we add in an additional uh, vasopressor therapy, and for level seven, it's still death. Okay, so we have these two pulmonary endpoints that we're gonna evaluate at day five. And so here's the schematic of how this goes. Here, uh, this picture represents three agents, and in, you know, we're using stage, I guess stage one is the point before the futility assessment. Um, and so we've got these three agents, they enter stage one, they accrue enough individuals to uh, undergo this futility analysis, which was 150 people randomized to that agent. Um, some agents pass, some agents don't. Um, and this uh, decision about you know, whether an agent passes or not is, is left to uh, DSMB, the Data Safety Monitoring Board. And then if you get to stage two, then you might enroll the whole study. Um, there's additional monitoring which occurs um, and, and, and that's the, the schematic, okay. So the DSMB, the Data Safety Monitoring Board was empowered to make many critical decisions in our, T in our protocol, okay. So the, just so for those of you who aren't familiar, the DSMB is an independent group of scientists with relevant expertise appointed by the study sponsor, which is NIAD here. Um, <clears throat> And so this would include, you know, uh, MDs, statisticians, ethicists who will uh, look at the interim results and they get to see treatment assignments. They're unblinded to, uh, to, 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 to all, everything that's going on. Um, they, review, they review reports generated by unblinded statisticians and then discuss these reports with the unblinded statisticians. Um, and so there's a, a group of five to 10 unblinded statisticians who are working across all study agents at this time. 
And so this is actually kind of, we were trying to figure out how to break up the work when you've got multiple agents in the clinical trial. Um, it's a little bit too much work for one person. And uh, if we're gonna evaluate drugs using the same criteria, which I think is a, something you'd wanna do out of fairness to the companies who are uh, contributing their agents to this study, um, we want this reports to be consistent. So that actually requires us to look at each other's work and have a common framework for doing these reports. So the first version of the protocol um, also had different eligibility criteria depending on if an agent passed the futility assessment. So um, initially, Participants were only eligible if they were, you know, they, they, they can't be healthy. So level one doesn't work, but levels two to four of the pulmonary endpoint, which is basically receiving some supplemental oxygen, but not too much. Okay. Um, and um, if an agent passes futility, then all el hospitalized eligible, all hospitalized patients would be eligible for the, for the trial was the original version. Okay, so the there, we have some guidelines to the DSMB for the futility assessment. So it's um, based on both endpoints. It's undertaken once 150 participants have been randomized to an agent. Um, and the, the, the rule we gave to them was uh, the test for no treatment difference. If, if you can reject that with a one-sided significance level of 0.3, the agent passes. So this is a pretty lenient criterion we thought um, and, you know, we recognize that some false positives are probably going to get through, but there'll be other opportunities to sort of kick drugs out of the study if they don't look like they work. Okay. Um, and so our advice was if neither endpoint meets the threshold, the agent does not pass. Um, if there's, you know, one meets and one doesn't, we left it up to the DSMB to decide. And we also will provide additional relevant data, such as the data on the primary endpoint that we've accrued so far at this intermediate review uh, to the DSMB to assist them with making this decision. Okay, um, so there's other aspects of interim monitoring, inter interim monitoring in this study. Um, in particular, a lot of these drugs basically have no preliminary data. I mean, they, you know, we often talk about different phases of, 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 uh, of clinical trials. So that phase one is sort of the, 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 the first the first phase of a clinical trial where there's really nothing's known about a drug and you're basically looking at safety. So, um, and then you have stage two, stage three, you know, st stage two is typically thought of as smaller studies with dose, dose ranging studies to try to figure out dosing. And stage three are the sort of large scale efficacy studies. So we're basically going from agents which haven't been through a phase one study up through at the end of this a phase three study. Um, and so we're trying to be very careful about this. And so we, you know, once about 30 individuals have received the agent, we wanted the DS that we have the DSMB take a look. Um, there are other, uh, other sorts of interim monitoring which occurs. So there are assessments for futility and harm and benefit throughout the trial. Um, and originally we talked about actually having these sorts of assessments being possible prior to the initial futility assessment. We have since jettisoned that idea. Okay, so just to be really clear, because actually study team members have gotten confused on how, how all this goes, we monitor for safety. For safety, we're looking for differences in the, the incidence of deaths, uh, serious adverse and events and adverse events between the two treatment arms. So we're, we're monitoring, you know, are a bunch of deaths going on in the, in the treatment arm compared to placebo, that would be a safety concern. We also monitor for something that we call harm. So this would be the treatment effect going for the primary endpoint going in the wrong direction, okay? So our primary endpoint is uh, time to sustained recovery. So if it looks like the time to sustained recovery is longer in the treatment arm, that would be harm, okay? We also monitor for benefit. So it's also possible that the treatment effect is so large that you know, it would be unethical to just you know, enroll a thousand people and withhold the treatment from, it, from patients who could benefit from it. And finally, we monitor for futility, which is a different question. That's the question is if, if the treatment effect is so small, it's unlikely the trial will be positive. So that's, that's really our initial, the goal of our initial futility assessment is to just see, you know, is, is this treatment gonna work at all? If not, let's, let's abandon it. So we don't have a bunch of, we don't, you know, have a bunch of people randomized to a, a drug we don't think is ever gonna work. Okay, so here's a summary of all that because it's kind of a lot. Um, so we randomized 300 participants to study agent or placebo for each agent, okay? We conduct a futility assessment. If the agent passes that futility assessment, 
we maintain the blind, okay? So no one gets, the treatment assignments aren't known. Um, and we increase enrollment to enroll a total of 1,000 participants for the primary endpoint. So that includes the initial 300 for the futility assessment, okay? And initially our expanded enrollment would be, it would include more severely ill individuals. Um, and then if the agent doesn't pass, we would stop enrollment, but we would maintain the blind for treatment assignment so that we could at least learn about as, uh, safety in an unbiased fashion. And we're gonna follow these individuals for 90 days. Okay. And I guess if the agent passes, 1000 individuals are followed for 90 days, but we, the trial outcome depends on events, which we it, <coughs> which are likely to occur before 90 days. So there's some statistical issues. I'm just gonna mention them rather than really get into it. Um, so competing risks are, are an issue if your primary endpoint is time to sustained recovery. So that is, death is a competing risk for recovery. So you have to account for that. Um, fortunately, this is you know, a pretty a well, under, a well understood issue in the statistics literature. And there's a, a whole host of, of methods which are analogous to the traditional time to event methods that you may be familiar with. It's all the same stuff, but named for different people. Okay, we'll see some of that later on. Um, the protocol specifies stratification by site pharmacy because our randomization is stratified by site pharmacy. So, so you can think of that as sites. Um, some sites share a pharmacy. Um, so that's why we have site pharmacy here. Um, and so since randomization is stratified by site pharmacy from the principle of you know, having your analysis follow your design, stratification by the analysis should stratify by far site pharmacy, but that can be difficult because some sites only randomize a few people. And so that nature, that adjustment for site, the results can be sensitive to that. Okay. Um, treatment of death. It's a critical secondary endpoint. Um, so, so how do you deal with that, right? So we're, we, we wanna see if people, we, we don't want them to have death and we want them to have a sustained recovery. So how do you make a composite endpoint from two disparate sort of outcomes? Well, one way to do this is with a, a, a relatively recently devised statistic called the win ratio statistic. And so that's a critical secondary endpoint for, for, for this study. So just quickly review, what are we doing here at the U of M and the CCBR? Okay, so, so Jim Neaton's the PI of the Insight Network, which is the network which is leading all these efforts. So, um, so sites get paid based on performance. So all the money for the, all the sites in this study come through the U of M because of this, okay. Um, the U of M is the trial sponsor for European sites. And th this is um, something that's developed over the last 20 years in the Insight Network. It's basically NIH can't sponsor trials in Europe because a lot of European sites require clinical trial insurance and NIH can't take that out. So University of Minnesota does. Um, so faculty in biostatistics, so Jim Neaton, David Vock, Tom Murray, myself, David Vock, uh, sorry, uh, Joe Koopminers at one point was involved, he's less so now. Also faculty in statistics, Birgit Grund, we're all members of the protocol team. So we helped draft the protocol, we wrote the statistical analysis section, we participate in endless phone Zoom calls, um, all that good stuff. Uh, the CCBR provides data management support, hosts all the study data on our servers. Um, so, you know, we developed all the case report forms, staff here did. Um, staff here developed the randomization application, which you can maybe imagine is pretty complex because we're randomizing to different drugs and placebo and the nature of that randomization could change over time. Um, and, and it does because drug supplies can be, can, can vary. Um, let's see, our, our safety office, which is a, a group of people with regulatory expertise and safety reporting here. We're handling all submissions to the European regulatory authorities. These are SUSAR submissions, if you're familiar with these sort of European regulatory uh, nature for clinical trials. And we're over, our, the group here oversees safety reporting at all sites. And we're responsible for all the data analysis and DSMB reporting. And so um, Birgit, David, Tom, and myself are the unblinded PhD level statisticians. And there's also unblinded MS level statisticians who work with us and are really critical to all this work. So here's what I did last summer. This is the timeline up through our first agent. Okay, so um, uh, on May 31st, this all began and we started meeting right away. Um, within two weeks, we had a protocol to uh, uh, an NIH internal review committee um, we got some feedback from that committee um, and integrated it into the protocol, and then we submitted it to the DSMB for their review. 
Um, I think around that time, we also we submitted it, submitted it to the FDA for feedback, and there was back and forth with the FDA. Um, shortly in the middle of July, we also submitted to the central IRB at Vera to get that all going for US sites. And, um, and so then you can see by late July, we have gotten at Vera's uh, approval for the protocol and the FDA gave the uh, safe to proceed. Um, and so on August 7th, the first participant was randomized. Um, you know, early, early September, there was this early safety review with 35 participants. Um, that turned out okay. We had additional safety reviews by the DSMB. It's a very hardworking DSMB because they don't only oversee this, but other active studies. Um, and uh, in October 13th was a critical safety review, and um, October 26th was the was the final safety review. So let's let's get into some of that a little bit more. So the first agent we studied was a, an agent by Eli made by Eli Lilly, and it's called Bam Lanivimab. Um, and uh, there, there's a number of ongoing trials for this agent, some of them in outpatient trials, some of them were outpatient trials. Um, and at early on, because of the lack of safety data, the uh, protocol team requested the DSMB review weekly safety reports. Okay, so every Monday we generate this report and send it to the, uh, the DSMB, which looks at safety events that have occurred over the previous week. Okay, so, um, sort of innocently enough while making one of these safety reports, uh, Birgit Grund and, and Debbie Wentworth here just happened to look at what was going on with the, uh, the, 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 uh, the ordinal outcome. And it looked like the ordinal outcome it did, it crossed a, a monitoring boundary for harm. So it looked like this agent actually was, was, you know, it, it was, was worse than getting the placebo. Okay, but this was complicated because the protocol had not planned on weekly safety reviews, never mind statisticians doing a sort of cursory futility assessment at the weekly safety review. So it was not a pre specified uh, safety review. And so, you know, it, it was difficult to interpret because we don't know, you know, this could have an impact on, on power if you're doing additional safety reviews and, and potentially stopping a study. So, you know, Birgit and Debbie just told the DSMB about it. So the DSMB's response was to pause randomization. Um, the, 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 it looked like the early futility assessment was a couple weeks away. That is enough people have been randomized. We just needed to wait for the five day data. And so um, on August 26th, the DSMB met again and they sus suspended randomization of the agent altogether. And so by that time, the safety signal that um, that, that Birgit and Debbie had, had detected, it had gone away, okay? So it was just a, t a transitory thing. Um, but the F estimate for efficacy actually was in favor of the placebo. So you were better off in the placebo group, okay? So, so the DSMB stopped that agent. So here's some of the results from the uh, resulting manuscript. Um, so here's a comparison of the two groups on day five for the pulmonary plus ordinal outcome. So as it turned out, the pulmonary and pulmonary plus ordinal outcomes were nearly identical. I think there were two people who had different um, levels based on the two different outcomes. So that they're almost interchangeable. Um, so this LY CoV555 is, is the name of BAM Lanivimab Bam before it got its fancy marketing name. And um, as you can see, so if you, if you go from the bottom, dark color, or the red colors are bad. So you can see the placebo group is generally as you change color, it's at a lower level. That is, there's more people in worse categories in the in the in the treatment group. And if you look at the time for sustained recovery for those who um, had been followed long enough to have potentially had such a, an event, um, which is about 160 people, 170 people, um, the the curves are basically superimposable. Okay, so the, here is a plot of what we call the cumulative incidence function. So that's like the competing risk analog of the Kaplan-Meier curve. So there are two Kaplan-Meier curves. They're basically right on top of each other, okay, but adjusted for, for deaths. And uh, the rate, the recovery rate ratio is 1.06. That's, that's like a, a hazard rate, okay? So rather than the, your, your Cox proportional hazards model, you've got this uh, fine gray method, as it's called. Um, so since there weren't a lot of sustained recoveries, we've also been looking at time to hospital discharge, and those are also 
basically superimposable, maybe with actually it looking like the placebo group has, um, <clears throat> it is a little bit favored. Okay, so no real evidence that this compound is, is helpful. And so just as, you know, as life goes, about two weeks after stopping randomization, the FDA granted this compound emergency use authorization amongst those who are diagnosed with COVID-19 but have mild disease and are not hospitalized. So, um, and it's currently in use at a number of locations in the US. It's, it, it's difficult though, because there's not much priority for giving outpatients infusions at this time. Understandably, most of the uh, effort at hospitals nowadays is at vaccinating people. So there aren't places to do infusions. I know like HCMC. Um, so although this is possible, it, it doesn't get a lot of use. So we um, update the protocol whenever we have a new agent. And so we have two new agents in version two, um, VIR 7831 and BRI 196-198. And when we change the version, the FDA based on data they have that they did not share with us, of course, uh, said we cannot expand enrollment to very sick patients even if the agent passes futility. So that we were not allowed to give this to people who were very sick. Okay. So, um, so we started in, in <clears throat> December, BRI entails two separate infusions. Um, <clears throat> so we try to, so this is the first time we had two agents in the study and the goal was to always try to treat the two agents as independent clinical trials. And this is, you know, a, a, a definitely something we, we wanted to do to respect the companies so that they're not competing with each other. They're competing with the placebo group. Um, but nonetheless, it's a common DSMP who's reviewing all the, all the drugs and the meetings take place at the same time. Okay. So on March 1st, the DSMB met to review the futility analysis for the two agents. So that's, um, there were 344 enrolled in the GSK VIR sub-study, 308 day five data, 343 in the BRI study, 306 with uh, day five data. And the placebo arms, there were shared, but actually they differed by one person because two of the sites were temporarily stocked out of one of the drugs. Um, and so they couldn't be randomized. So they weren't included in the, in the placebo group for that other drug. So yesterday um, the NIH released a press release uh, describing the outcome of this futility analysis um, wasn't news to me because randomization stopped on March 1st. Um, and so there's a, another monoclonal antibody still being studied made uh, in TICO, it's an AstraZeneca product and a, a randomization of that agent of placebo continues. So here's the press release. I mean, I, you know, it, it, it's actually kind of interesting from, from where I'm sitting. Um, so I, I, you can see that the, uh, I guess the, the, the first, the se second sentence I'd draw your attention to, the initial analysis of data from the VIR 7831 indicated that it met the pre-specified criteria for study continuation. So that is, it met the criteria, the, this p-value less than 0.3, okay, via some method of, of uh, analysis, right? So, um, it, it, so then they go on and say participants entering the control group had more advanced illness. So there's this chance imbalance at baseline. And when you adjust for that, it actually, the p-value goes above 0.3. Um, and then, you know, you might think, well, we talked about adjusting for site pharmacy. Well, how exactly you do that, you can make the p-value move all around 0.3. Um, and so, you know, the, th this was a a very difficult decision for the DSMB. The, the meeting went on for like two hours where we were discussing this. And um, ultimately the, the, the DSMB decided that there just wasn't enough evidence to, uh, to continue the study. So briefly, some, some challenges have been um, included international approvals. So we're starting with FDA approval and the European regulators are just not that swayed by FDA approval for our study. And they've applied more stringent criteria due to the lack of safety data. So, I mean, fair enough, there's, there's not strong safety data for basically any of these agents. Um, <clears throat> site registration has been a real challenge. So when we have a new agent, we have a new version. And in order for a site to in, uh, randomize individuals to that new drug or on the new version of the protocol, they have to re-register their site. So it's sort of like you build up all these sites for version one, and then the study gets the, the, the futility analysis finds we're not going to con continue with drug any drug one anymore. And then you have to re-register your site for version two. And we've got, you know, I guess scores of sites, I might say, in various stages with the various versions. 
Um, consenting participants is a real pain when you've got multiple drugs, especially when some of the drugs might stock out at some of the, at some of the sites. So the site has to know what drug somebody might be randomized to, and then there's additional pages to the consent to describe that drug, okay? <clears throat> so that, that, that's kind of a, a tricky thing that we had to work out. Um, because these are new drugs, they're frequently in limited supply, and something I'd never really appreciated till I worked on this trial is that if a company makes a drug, they, what's the expiration date is anybody's guess. So the FDA has strict limits on what the expiration date for a drug that they have no experience with what that should look like. You know, they have some regulations of what that should look like. And then the, it's up to the companies to provide data to try to extend the expiration dates so that the drug can be kept at the site longer. And we've had situations where we were running right up the, against the expiration date and the companies are arguing with the FDA saying that their data you know, shows that the expiration date should be longer based on you know, the chemical properties and decay of properties in the drug. Um, so that makes consent and randomization even more complex because you know, we're stocking out of drugs. Okay, so um, next steps for the TICO trial are we're working on introducing new agents. Um, there's a lot of interest in looking at agents other than neutralizing monoclonal antibodies, given the lack of success with these agents so far. Um, we're continuing to follow up with those enrolled, and uh, we have ongoing biomarker work to try to understand if some of these agents might be more useful in subgroups of patients. So we're, in particular, you know, we're looking at it, it, could we find evidence for certain people having high levels of antigen and low levels of antibodies, and then maybe those individuals would be the, the right people to treat. So thanks, and I'm um, happy to take any questions or, or, or comments at this point. Thank you. Fascinating, thank you. We do have a lot of questions, so we'll jump right into them. Great. From Ryan Demmer, <clears throat> uh, very exciting and impactful talk. Um, if I understand correctly, pulse oximetry is part of the definition of some outcomes. How has the FDA announcement that pulse oximetry varies by race impacted the trials, if at all? So we are not using pulse, pulse oximetry in any sort of overt way at all in this trial. Um, we've discussed it in some other trials, but we've just avoided it because there's a many problems with trying to use it as part of an outcome. You know, when do you assess it? Um, how many times? Just, we don't have a lot of experience with that. And so we've talked about using that in some of our other trials, in particular, this hyperimmune IVIG trial that we're putting together right now. Um, but yeah, we've, we've stayed away from using that as any component of an endpoint. From Kumi Smith, uh, I've heard NIH insisted on standard outcomes for all the OWS vaccine trials, so results could be directly compared. Have there been similar conversations across the various therapeutic trial platforms? Example, the ordinal outcome. Yeah, so there, there, there is a, a great desire to have some sort of standardization or at least the potential for standardization. And that's really the latter is sort of description is what we've been focusing on. So what we try to do is collect sufficient quantities of data so that we can replicate other people's ordinal outcomes in our own studies. And so I, I, that's important work to do so we can compare results across different trials and different compounds. So yeah, definitely important. And we, we do our best we can you know, to try to collect that data, but then you know, we want to design our own trial and select our own endpoints. From Andrew Weiss, how did the investigators arrive at the significance level of 0.3 regarding the futility assessment? Yeah, so there's a couple different ways. So um, we initially relied on some previous work by Max Parma, who I mentioned previously, who's the one of the primary statisticians in the Stampede trial. And um, they sort of looked empirically across their studies and saw that, you know, if you use 0.3, you know, then you can have an early look and not dispose of too many uh, agents. There's also some theoretical work conducted by Mike Prosham and uh, Dean Fullman at the NIH, who sort of said, how would you do this, you know, this two-stage design? What sort of criterion should you use for stage one? And um, using something along the lines of 0.3.4 was optimal from the perspective of discovering the largest number of agents. If you have a pool of say 20 or 30 agents and you know 10% of them are effective. So there have been some sort of empirical motivation for that number and there are some theoretical motivations too. I, I don't think that paper has been published yet, but um, yeah, so difficult choice, but that's kind of what we came up with. 
Yeah, excellent. That's really interesting. From Emily Faraday, um, do you also stratify by treatment site location? There could be very different treatment practices in terms of standard of care, hospital capacity by treatment site. Yeah, we do. So, um, so that's we our, our randomization stratifies by that, and we attempt to control for that when we do the analysis. But it's this latter attempting to control for site when we do the analysis that's a little problematic, um, and that's kind of what drove this discrepancy with the with the VIR results. Is how exactly you do that controlling or adjusting for site really has an impact, and so we definitely can control for it during randomization. We try to in the analysis stage. From Jim Panko, having people with the specialized knowledge and skill set required to manage and run clinical trials is very important. Are there enough young scientists being trained in clinical trials management to work at the CCBR and similar coordinating centers around the country? You know, that's, that's a real challenge. Um, we are doing our best here to do that. Um, but, you know, I guess one of the big challenges is it's it's very difficult for junior invest, I mean, outside typically, this is, I guess this is the exception, COVID-19 is the exception, but typically it's difficult for junior investigators to get involved with clinical trials because it takes so long to get publications out of them. And so it's kind of a, a barrier to, to work in the area. But, you know, I guess this is kind of an exception because we're, we're churning out results like Matt in COVID-19. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a real problem. We're trying to address it as best we can. One from Kamakshi, um, Lakshmanarian. How many sites total were recruiting patients? Can you describe the geographical distribution of sites? Yeah, so um, we had a total, at, at, this, at the time of this last utility assessment, there were 33 sites that contributed participants. I think we had up to 50 or 60 sites registered for version two or three a couple weeks ago. Um, for version one, I think we had similar numbers. Um, the geographic location has largely been in the U.S. Um, we had a site in Singapore for, for all these trials. For the um, version two and three, we have had sites in Europe, mainly Denmark and Spain. Um, the sites in the U.S. have been pretty much uniformly distributed throughout the U.S. The biggest enrollers, though, have definitely been, I guess, like Baylor in Dallas and, uh, and Duke in North Carolina. So they've contributed the most participants to the, to the most recent version. I'm passing the microphone to Alan Lifson. Alan, if you would unmute. Hey, Kevin, that was terrific. Um, just a quick question I was typing, you know, the, the utility of monoclonals and, and other therapies, you know, very likely depend on the stage of, of COVID disease in which they're introduced. And particularly thinking about your comment about BAM and the FDA, you know, how, you looked at a specific population and is there thought in terms of how your results compare with other studies that have looked at, you, you, you know, uh, implementation of monoclonals at, at different stages of COVID disease? Yeah, I mean, BAM is the good example, really, that, you know, if there doesn't look like there's evidence in more advanced disease, um, this is also, kind of been the thinking with remdesivir too, is that you better get it to people early. Um, there are, you know, I guess, um, steroid, you know, corticosteroids and people who have advanced disease have shown some promise, but, but not much else. Um, and so there's definitely thinking that the earlier you treat, the more likely you're gonna have a positive outcome. And I guess the other side of that would be the earlier an agent is used, the more likely it's gonna be effective. And, and I guess that's what we're seeing with BAM. Although you might dispute some of the data, I mean, I some of the data presented for uh, the, the, the phase two studies is, you know, is, is difficult to, in, sorry, the, the, sorry, the, in the outpatient study, some of it's difficult to interpret, but yeah, I mean, there's definitely a sense of the timing is critical and earlier is better. Great. Let's see here, any other questions? <clears throat> I was um, wondering about underlying conditions and I, unless I missed it, the answer is probably, you know, you, you probably more or less ignore those in a trial like this and then maybe explore effect modification later if a trial has enough legs. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I, I didn't, we, we definitely track that. Um, we, you know, we see a lot of people with hypertension, diabetes, and renal impairment. Those are the top three. 
Um, we have not done a lot of investigations of you know, the extent to which having sort of pre-existing conditions impacts the efficacy of the treatments. But that's definitely an interesting question and something we can investigate. Okay, David Jacobs, you're welcome to unmute. <clears throat> Sometimes it takes a while. Got it. I, I had just uh, finished typing, but it's so hard to type in that Zoom thing. I wondered, Kevin, if you could describe a successful treatment. Have you found one? I wish we had, but not in this trial. Um, we have, so Insight has a couple other trials going on. Um, we have one for um, hyperimmune IVIG that's I actually am not really involved with, and that I think that one will be unblinded soon. So we're hopeful that we'll have a positive story to tell, but nothing good so far from Tico. Um, the you know other studies have certainly identified useful compounds. And just this past week in the New England Journal, I think there were three articles on promising agents, mainly you know anti-inflammatory agents. So there 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 are some success stories out there. No real smashing successes so far. Um, but definitely some things that seem to shorten the time in the hospital. Do you, do you think that that might be because you're being too conservative? I guess I could answer my own question. I don't think so, but I would like to hear your answer. Yeah, I, I don't think we're being too conservative. I, 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 you know, I mean, maybe the sustained recovery is a little more conservative than hospital discharge, but we're not seeing different signals across those different endpoints. Um, the, you know, the, the, the futility analysis, I think is, you know, we, we all said 0.3, that seems kind of high. And, you know, and then we said, no, we mean 0.3 one-sided. And, and then, you know, so I, I, you know, that that was even hard for people to wrap their head around. Um, so I, I don't think that's the problem. I think it's probably timing as Alan was referring to. Thanks. I will add that we haven't, you know, we get asked about timing a lot. And so we do analyses where we stratify by number of days since symptom onset, and we still don't see anything with these agents. Brian Demmer. Hey, Kevin, great talk. Thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to ask from a national priority perspective, in your opinion, how much do you think we should be investing in treatment trials versus just vaccine rollout and adapting vaccines to variants as they come out? And it, just to be clear, I'm, I'm not suggesting we don't need treatment trials or we should get rid of that arm of what we're doing, but it, we're in this moment where it's a classic public health versus uh, clinical medicine conundrum where we often overinvest in treatment and underinvest in prevention. So I'm wondering what you think about that. Yeah, no, I mean, vaccine, vaccination is critical. Um, but, uh, you know, surprising thing for me in this most recent analysis for the DSMB is that, so of, of our hospitalized patients in this trial, we're seeing five to 10% who's report being vaccinated. So vaccinations are critical, but they're not, they're, they're not a silver bullet. I mean, it, there are people who still get infected despite being vaccinated. So, you know, I think they're both important. Um, you know, which is more important, it's hard to say. I, I, I guess I'm not gonna go on record about that, but I, you know, I, I, vaccination is, prevention is, you know, is, is the way to go, but it, it's not 100% foolproof or effective. Thanks, appreciate the perspective. Yeah. Got a question here from Nancy Sherwood. Can you say more about the subgroup response heterogeneity issue you brought up on your last slide and how you would build that into your design? Right, so I mean, I, I guess the um, the most obvious thing would be to just restrict. It, it, so we'll get into the logistics of that. A complicated. You might restrict the uh, treatment to those who 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 have high levels of antigen and low levels of antibody. How, however, you might want to define that. Um, but there is sort of the the challenge here is that the antigen assay that we're using is not exactly real time. Um, so that would have all kinds of logistical problems to try to implement that. But that would be the sort of thinking is let's, you know, let's focus on the subgroups who benefit the most um, and recognize that if we, at least we could find effective treatments for some people. Top of the hour. That, that was a great discussion. Thank you so much. We're at the top of the hour.
Um, I, I, I want to appreciate um, your, you taking the time. This was fascinating. I'm looking forward to a lot more moving forward. And thank you, everybody, for joining. And we will hope to see you uh, next week for, for the next webinar. Thanks so much.